Holy God, help us to rest in this truth that you are proud of us. Proud of who we are, just as you created us to be. Proud of us being salt and light. Speak now in this place and move powerfully among us so that we may encounter the word afresh in one another. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. It is in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that we all pray. Amen. So, beloved, this Pride Month, we have been reflecting on the meaning of pride. In this sermon series entitled Pride, about loving all that is holy, all that's holy in the world, all that's holy in ourselves. In June is Pride Month, and this week is Juneteenth, and so at Union we celebrate this whole month as an intersectional expression of God's liberating love, that divine grace exhibited by the courage and resilience of queer people, African Americans, and queer black folks. Because, beloved, God is love. And as Pastor Jay elaborated last week, God is proud of us. Proud of us for being exactly who God created us to be. Pastor Jay has been walking us through these three movements for the Pride series, starting with one, homosexuality is not a sin. Two, pride is not a sin. And three, perhaps we should be questioning the category of sin altogether. At the base of this Pride series is the basic understanding that homosexuality is not a sin. And I use air quotes because this term at homosexuality is outdated, and it doesn't even begin to capture the creative diversity of the human experience of gender and sexuality. And so we celebrate that gender and sexuality are part of how God has created us to be, and we can be proud of who God has made us to be. And so, like the prophet Jeremiah says, if we are to boast, let us boast in the Lord. Let us boast in the Lord, our God, who created us in their image. Let us boast in the many sexualities and attractions and gender expressions and gender identities that spice up this wild life that we live with God and with one another. And let us boast in the holiness of who we are and how we love, because in the being and in the loving, we make manifest the love and liberation of God as revealed in Christ Jesus. And so we see that in the boasting, in this pride, in this brilliant boldness of being who God created us to be, pride is not a sin. And still, I feel there is some need to name that pride must be clarified. It must be distinguished from pride that does have a bad rep. Because this pride that we're talking about, it's, it's the pride of holistic confidence in oneself. It's that blessed assurance of being a child of God. This pride indeed is holy. It is the pride we feel when we put great care into our work and our creativity. It is the pride of a parent or grandparent that experiences deep joy when they see their child succeed in life. It is the pride that we have when we can celebrate ourselves for who we are without modifications and without shame. This pride is a gift from God. This pride is a divine grace that transforms and renews us as God has already created us to be. But we also know that sometimes things in this world, they can get twisted. And pride can get twisted. It can be misused. It can be abused. There's a way that twisted pride begins to separate us from one another. Or we begin to pretend that we are self-sufficient. And we forget who we are and whose we are. This sense of superiority, it brings isolation. And with it, a growing scarcity mentality. A scarcity mentality that begins to anxiously protect its precarious positioning. We've all experienced this twisting of pride, whether it was within ourselves or weaponized against us. It's the kind of pride that propagates prejudice. It's what sets up and preserves inequitable social hierarchies. It is what the scripture writers call the heart of stone. The heart of stone of Pharaoh. This heart of stone that is warned about, that has dire consequences. The stony heart that can no longer hear the voice of God. The stony heart that no longer senses empathy for the oppressed. The stony heart that understands that violence is the final arbiter of conflict resolution. And we know this twisted pride by many names, hubris, 
arrogance or in its systemic forms, white supremacy, heterosexism, patriarchy, and machismo. And in the end, these oppressive systems are born from a sense of superiority. And clearly, this goes against the will of God. Because from God's perspective, we are all equal. We are all beloved children of God, children of the Most High. To think or to act otherwise not only harms the beloved community, but it degrades our very souls. Now, I feel that on Father's Day, it's important to take time to reflect on pride in a nuanced way. Now, I know there are many fathers and father figures among us today, and most of us have fathers, biological or chosen, and children often yearn for one thing, to feel like their father or their parent is proud of them. And in the healthiest of relationships, this father's pride is unconditional and ever-growing, growing the way a child grows into their own image of God. This is what we mean when we say that God is proud of us. And so we give thanks to God for loving dads and father figures who love us this way on this day. And still, for many of us, pride of a father was often doled out scarcely or withheld to punish us or to mold us in a particular way contrary to who we know God calls us to be. Now, of course, none of this lies simply along gendered lines. And to be sure, those harmed most directly by patriarchy and machismo are women and children. And still, we must interrogate the ways that boys and men are also, are also targets of these systems. The difficulty is that while men benefit from and perpetuate these systems, we are also trapped and deluded by them, deluded into thinking that our thriving must depend on the subjugation of others. Patriarchy seeks to control all bodies and all minds. In addition to superiority over non-men, patriarchy seeks to limit the emotionality of men, increases pressure for risky and irresponsible behaviors, and it creates this illusion that the only way to relate to others is through violence or the withholding of it. So Father's Day is complicated for many of us because so many fathers have been purveyors of patriarchy. So for some, Father's Day is a chance to stop, to reflect, a chance to turn around, to repent, and to return to God's tenderness and mercy. And for others, Father's Day is a chance to take stock of the ways that we have already been healing from patriarchy and machismo. So on Father's Day, in this Pride Month, those who find yourselves as fathers and father figures, you may reflect on these questions. Are you proud of the father that God has called you to be? And are you working to make sure that your children and those that you care know that you are proud of them? Proud for being just who God created them to be. And for those of us with father wounds, we may rest and heal in this simple truth that we rest the series on. God is proud of you. God is proud of you. God is proud of you. Beloved, God is proud of us. And I know this because Jesus says so. In fact, he went up onto a mountaintop to preach this message to us. On his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus started by naming those who are blessed, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek and the hungry and thirsty for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and those persecuted for righteousness' sake. And after these beatitudes, as we call them, Jesus makes a proclamation about who we are, and it is a firm foundation upon which we stand. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the earth of the world. I can just see Jesus beaming with pride as he utters these words to his disciples. You, you are my beloved. You blessed siblings of mine, you are the very salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. What would this world be without you? This world would be so bland without your saltiness. This world would be so dim without your spark. I am so proud of you. Now, what is amazing is Jesus says this before his disciples have done anything. 
Jesus' pride is rooted in love before achievement. In this pride, like the whole Sermon on the Mount, extends to all of us. Now, often when we think of Jesus' teachings, we think of parables and commandments. And to be sure, the Sermon on the Mount is full of commandments. But before Jesus moves to teaching us how to live differently and how to live more faithfully, he's careful to set this foundation. Before telling us what to do, Jesus tells us who we are. Fundamentally, we are blessed. We are salt and we are light, which is to say we are beloved of God. And so we begin with belovedness. We begin with dignity. We begin with abundance. And it is from this place, out of the sense of divine pride and who God is calling us to be, outpours the good works of God. Now, there is a temptation when we hear the Beatitudes and about being salt and light that we must somehow do something to earn this belovedness, to earn this blessedness, to somehow build our saltiness, to ignite this light of God. But the truth of the matter is is that Christ frees us from the need to prove ourselves. Christ instead frees us to simply be ourselves, our holy, whole selves. Christ frees us from the illusions to see the truth at the beginning of creation, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, created in the divine image of God. So Jesus begins with who we are. And who are we? Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. I love what the message translation says about this. You are here to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of the earth. We are the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of the earth. We live in a bland world, beloved. (laughs) A bland world that is in desperate need of some flavor. Has anyone had a batch of fries or a steak that wasn't properly salted? Bland food just sucks the joy out of life. It does not inspire. It does not please us. Indeed, blandness is integral to the design of this world. It lulls us to sleep. It convinces us that life is only about endless toil and meaninglessness. So God has called us to bring the flavor. You are in the places and spaces to help draw out the God flavors, beloved, to draw out the transcendence from the mundane, to bring out the vibrancy amidst dullness. And we know that cooking science tells us that salt is a powerful spice because it enhances flavor. It does this by reducing the taste of bitterness and amplifies all the other tastes, sweetness, sourness, and umami. So if we are to be salt, then we have this dual call to reduce bitterness and to amplify the God flavors. So if we are to be salt, we we think about this reducing bitterness. Bitterness is that which takes away the taste of life. We all know bitterness, complaining, grumbling, resentment. This bitterness spoils life. So let us not give in to bitterness, but let us seek to reduce it in ourselves and in one another. And so then on the flip side, let us bring out the fullness of the God flavors in our life. The sweet joys of triumphs and quality time. The sour tones of sadness and grief. And the full body umami of justice and kindness. Beloved, what are the God flavors that you bring out in this world? You know there are some. Now Jesus cautions us. If salt loses its flavor-enhancing properties, it will be good for nothing and thrown out and trampled underfoot. Jesus makes this pronouncement about who we are, the salt of the earth, and then cautions us to preserve ourselves in a world that seeks to change us and take away our power. So Jesus invites us every day to remember to stay salty. And may we help each other stay salty. And to stay salty, beloved, we must be in the world. Salt isn't any good left on the counter. So we need to be salt in the earth. It's the incarnational way, the way of Christ Jesus, to be fully immersed in this chaotic, beloved creation. And still, this world will try to tell us that we are nothing. It will try to grind us up. It will try to turn us against one another. But we need only remember who we are. We are the salt of the earth. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. God has made you a lamp of divine goodness. And get this, there's no on and off switch of this lamp. 
the divine light of God is already within you and forever shining while you grace this earth. And what is your light? Your light is that part of you that dispels the forces of despair and fear and makes the devil flee. Your light is that part of you that shines brightly amidst the dullness that adds color to a grayscale world that illuminates things as they really are. Because light is about truth, beloved, and the truth will set us free. And it, light is about being true to ourselves, about being true to God, and being truthful about what is really going on around us. And so Jesus urges us, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Abba God in heaven. Now, as I said, this may sound like a command, but like saltiness, it's really just a warning. Already you are light. Now do what you can to make sure that light shines uninhibited. The psalmist writes, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, God wants the world to taste and see God's glory and God's goodness, and so God created us. Salt and light, so that the world may taste and see more of God. We are the salt to amplify the embodied taste of God, and we are the light to shine God's glory in the world. Now, as we talk about pride, I need to be clear. Our saltiness and our radiance are not our property that we can jealously hide or shy away. Instead, they are our properties provided by the source. It's who we are. It's, it, so let us be proud of who God has created us to be, not by our own striving alone, but by the gifts and graces received by God and nurtured by our beloved communities. So hear the good news, beloved. Your presence matters. In fact, your presence here changes things for the better. You help draw out the God flavors in this place, and your light is cherished and honored in this place. So, beloved, soon we will turn to Christ's holy table, and we will partake in holy communion. And it is at this table that we make space for everyone, and we listen for the sound of the genuine in each person. And in this sacrament, the light of Christ greets the light in us, in ours, and one another. And together we bask in the glory of God this glory that showers us in glorious grace, that heals, that liberates, and that recreates. At this table, beloved, we bring our saltiness to bring out the God flavors in one another. And we shine our light, letting our spark shine bright and uninhibited. And when we do this, we will realize that we are truly made for one another and that the Spirit of God is among us. So hear the words of Jesus this morning inviting us to the table. You are already the salt of the earth. You are already the light of the world. God is proud of you. Praise be to God. Amen.